Hello again, everybody. Gary Furman and Matt Shodell here. And today we are talking about the 2023 recruiting class, the arrival of better, of good times at the University of Miami, where things are starting to look like they are supposed to look in a successful college football program. And uh, let me just go ahead and explain. Uh, okay, so again, because of all the turbulence that was going on before this in 2020, 2021, and 2022, where those were not good recruiting classes, where um, the majority of each one of those classes ended up being uh, tossed by the wayside or, or, or somehow um, weeding itself out of the program. Uh, this is the class, and I know it's more recent, which helps, but that is starting to look a little bit better, okay? Um, let me start. There have been six guys. And uh, let me see. So the total signees in that class, Matt, was, I believe, um, is 40. Okay. There, there were 40 total players that were part of this class. Okay. A very big class because of the number of spots that they had to fill. All right. Six of them are already out of the program. But a few of those you would definitely classify as hits. Um, you know, I would call KJ Cloyd. A hit. He was a part-time starter. I would call Javion Cohen a starter the entire season last year a hit. I would call Jaden Davis uh, a starter for pretty much the whole year a hit. Uh, got drafted. Uh, Branson Dean pretty much a starter the whole year. I would call him a hit. Matt Lee pretty much a starter. Uh, the, was a starter the whole year. I would call him a hit. So of those six guys, the only one that is, was clearly an absolute mistake was Tyler Harrell. Okay, so uh, we're now down to one out of six were just was was bad. That's pretty damn good. Okay, and I know I, those of you that watched yesterday's show, Matt Chodell was throwing out this forty percent number, and I was saying no, forty percent is not good enough. I want to see that get up to like fifty-five or or even sixty in some years through better evaluation. Well. Five out of six is what uh, you know. Just to, just dealing with guys that are out of the program now for uh, to move on to other things. Um, what's that? Six. Um, uh, that's uh, an eighty-three percent. Okay, hit rate right there on guys that are gone. Okay, now let me jump in and talk about guys that have um, transferred out or been sent out from the program. OK, uh, and in, in every one of these cases, uh, we're going to call them all misses because they, they are. OK, Collins Achimapong uh, had a very high star rating coming out of high school, but very clearly from the beginning was not good enough. Didn't have the work ethic. He ended up transferring to UCLA. Um, Devante Brown, the older brother of Damari, uh, just wasn't good enough. It'll be interesting to see what he does at FSU. He transferred to the Seminoles. Um, Demetrius Freeney, cornerback, not, not good enough, arrived from the JUCO ranks, had no chance to play. He transferred to Arizona. Um, Thomas Gore, undersized defensive tackle, probably shouldn't have been taken. Okay, They were feeling a little desperate at the time. They needed another defensive tackle. They took a shot with Thomas Gore. Um, just couldn't match up size-wise. He's now at Georgia Tech. Um, Marcellus Pulliam. He came in with pretty high hopes and was a looked like he was going to be a good looking linebacker. For whatever reason, it didn't translate. It didn't. It didn't work out. He didn't get a single rep as a freshman. Uh, he ran for the woods. He's at now at Michigan State. Um, Caleb Spencer, safety, also at times looked like he was going to be okay. Um, only played on special teams. He ended up transferring to Virginia Tech. Nobody's crying over losing any of these guys. And then Jaden Wayne, who actually played 135 reps last year, but still was not as good as the defensive ends that were going to be on this year's team. I mean, not even close to Ruben Bain, for example. Okay. Um, so, you know, not even close to Tyler Barron. So uh, Jaden Wayne, who, who was a fairly highly regarded high school recruit, probably commanded a reasonable uh, NIL deal, in all honesty, and probably was as much a salary cap <laughs> casualty as anything, he he was sent packing, okay? So all seven of those, we'll say, are misses, okay? 
Um, so now, now we have eight out of 40 that are misses. Okay. Um, anticipated starters. There's five from this class that are, look like they're going to be starting this year. Ruben Bain, Damari Brown, Dylan Joyce, uh, Francis Magoa and Francisco Magoa. Okay. Um, Samson Okanola is competing to start that, you know, right now you have to, you have to consider that a hit. Obviously as time goes on, you're going to want to see that he became a starter, but he is certainly on track. To be a starter, um, Raul Aguirre. Okay, he's going to be a backup this year, but he's on track to be a starter. AJ Allen is going to get a lot of reps at running back this year. I guess whether we call him a hit or not is going to depend on how productive he is. Um, he had some decent moments last year behind Henry Paris and Mark Fletcher. He had 361 yards rushing and five touchdowns. Malik Bryant is on a good track. Jackson Carver is probably on a track to be a miss. Okay, so we'll say one there. Anthony Campbell, hard to see where he fits. He made progress during the spring, but I'm guessing we're gonna we'll end up him a miss. So we'll say two. Um, Lewis Cristobal is a walk on now. We're not gonna even count him. I mean, he, he's here. He's the nephew of the head coach. He's he's a depth filler on the offensive line. Mark Fletcher is gonna be a hit. I think Josh Fortin is on track to eventually be a hit. Um, running back Christopher Johnson is on a good track. Ray Ray Joseph, uh, we'll see how his career progresses, but I don't think we were going to call him a miss at this point. Tommy Kinsler is a good looking old line prospect. We're going to have to see where that goes. Shamar Kirk looks like he's on track to be a miss. Okay. So I'm going to say he, that's number three. Cam McCormick, I'll say is number four. Um, Judeus Richard is going to play a lot at DB. I wouldn't call him a miss. Robert Stafford, way too soon to judge. Uh, Frankie Tinelau, way too soon to judge. Antonio Tripp is going to be a miss. Okay, so that's five. Uh, Bobby Washington, too soon to judge. Robbie Washington, probably too soon to judge. Emory Williams is on a decent track. Riley Williams is on a decent track. Okay, so right now we're looking at 13 guys in total out of 40. Okay, um, so Matt Shodell. That gets us to, I believe, 68% potential hit rate. Now, it may not end up there, but at least guys look like they're tracking in that direction. Even if it ends up being 60% when we're all said and done at the end of the day, that's a hell of a lot better than the pathetic hit rates that we've been talking about in, in the first three years of this series. Uh, 2023, the first time... Miami is tracking in the right direction. And the reason why we are sitting here today saying Miami can win 10, 11. Some people are even dreaming 12 football games this fall. Your thoughts. Well, and I know you got your graduate degree in calculus, but maybe next time get it in addition and subtraction because your math's off. But uh, look, you know, you can, you can cut it. You can you said 13 out of 40 is some percent other than 33 ish percent. So whatever. But, uh, anyway, the, um, it's 68% the, hit 13, they divided by, the, 13 divided tracking, by 40, 13 divided tracking. by 40, is 68%. percent Okay. You must've done really well in your math classes in high school. Yeah. 13 per 13 of 40 is 32%. Those yeah. are the misses. Those are the misses. Oh, those are the misses. They're hitting on, that means they're hitting wow. on almost sixty-eight. Uh, that shows you how much I. That shows you how much attention I pay to you because this, this, this whole hit or miss. This is all fantasy. Is what I was well, going to say before no. you started talking about it your is. math. Okay. This is not a final uh, calculus here for for the twenty twenty three recruiting class. No argument. Yeah, and and you're pieing the sky with everybody. It's ridiculous. But no. look, this is this is the this are, in the sky. I deal in the real world, not in Gary Furman's, you know, I guess there, what, if there's some new star forming in the Milky Way. I guess that's Gary must have landed his spaceship on that uh, today. Uh, but here's the facts. Uh, you know, you can cut it up any number of ways. And you can cut up doing transfer hit rates. I personally like to look at recruiting hit rates because, to me, that's Mario Cristobal's forte. That's how they're going to build the program. I can, you can just throw the transfers out the window for all I care. And in general, you're going to bring transfers in. They're going to start. You're going to, you should have a high hit rate for starting as a transfer. If you don't, it's just pathetic. Because you're generally, because you're generally just trying to bring, because you're generally just trying to bring those guys into as as fillers to start. Usually, you're not bringing, a, you're not convincing a guy to come. Hey, be a backup and play a few reps for us. They usually say, yeah, I'm going to find somewhere else. 
uh, and then they're not happy when that happens. So the, the good news is that uh, I believe there was 26 signees that were high school signees in this class, and six of them already started games. Now, that doesn't mean they're hits. You know, Emory Williams started games. He's not a hit, right? But, but, they bar but they've barely even been here. So the fact that already 23.1% of the signees have started a game, you know, when you look at hit rates of 10%, 14%, you know, in some of these classes we're looking at in high school kids, I mean, that's that's the most positive sign, not this, hey, only 13% are misses because I'm making stuff up out of nowhere that I think these guys, Raul Aguirre is going to be amazing and this guy is going to be amazing and that guy's going to be amazing and oh, this Antonio yeah. Triple never play here. Like, I'm not going to make stuff up out of nowhere and start throwing guys under the bus and saying they should leave the program because they're no good and start saying other and start anointing guys who are second and third teamers so far in their careers that have never really played at all and saying they're hits. I mean, that's ridiculous. The fact is, six of 26 have started. It's a great start. And I want to see about a th between 35 and 45 percent hit rate. I don't want it above 45 percent because that will equate to a lot, you know, to future classes not doing what they need to do. Uh, as much as Gary wants 100 percent hit rate, you know, if it was up to Gary, all 25 players would be starting for two years. Like what's in tech? Five percent of the class to be a failure, so you can make sure you have enough spots for the ensuing classes. Yeah, let's take this to the limit. If you have a 100% hit rate and 25 guys all start games and are productive for, on average, two years, that's what happened to some extent at, like, Virginia Tech, where they'd be good once I'll every four or five. 20 guys instead of 40 the next year. That's where Virginia Tech would be good, like, once – great, actually, once every four or five years. But then the classes behind them never were any good because they, they, they couldn't play. They never got reps. They never worked out. Um, so, so, yeah, I live in the real world. Not all recruits are going to be amazing, okay? Uh, nobody's ever had a 100% hit rate in a recruiting class. Uh, but if you can hit that 40% mark every single year, right around that, you're going to be in really good shape for the long haul because you're going to have balanced classes with a lot of top-level talent if you have the right 40%. Uh, and and, and then it, that's how you build a sustainable program. You start getting 80%, 100% hit rates. That just means the programs behind them sucked where they weren't better than the guys that were already there, right? Because if you're a starter... And the guys that come behind you are nowhere near good enough to, to take your place. You know, that's, that's not for anybody. That's not, that's not good enough for me. I want guys coming into the program who are better than the guys that are already here. And that's what the top programs do. They're not looking for guys who are, you know, oh, a little bit worse or sort of the same. You want guys that are going to be better than the guys you already have every single year because every team is constantly trying to upgrade their talent. You have to. Uh, so you want guys who are going to be better than the guys you have, guys that are going to replace the guys you have. And you're never going to see a hit rate like Gary Furman's imaginary, you know, um, you know, I don't know what gingerbread house he's building, but I mean, someone's just going to eat it and then poop it out. And that's what it's going to look like at the end of the day. It's going to look like a bunch of poop because you'll be great for a year or two and then you'll be back to square, starting at square one again. And then four or five years later, maybe you'll hit 100% again and be great. And then you're back to square one again. So this has to be sustainable long term. It's like saying, here's $100, Gary. Um, you have to live on it for a month. And you go out and just buy cookies and eat them all the first day. You could do that, and it's going to be great for a day or two, but you're going to starve to death by the end of the month. You have to space it out, be judicious, and, and keep getting better food, right? When the interest rate comes down, you can afford more cookies. Get more cookies at the end of the month, not at the beginning of the month. It sounds yeah. crazy. By the way, it does sound crazy to say, oh, you don't want 100% hits. It sounds crazy. But you don't – A, it can't work mathematically for a roster – and B, like you don't did. you you it's unsustainable. Just like that, just like taking all portal guys and paying them a millions of dollars and millions of dollars and millions of dollars and constantly churning it. There's going to be years where you just don't get the guys you need, you know, as and, opposed and to building it sustainably. Be, and there's going to be some guys from those guys that I mentioned here that are going to end up not being hits. They might be trending in the right direction right now. Some of them are not going to be hits, and the 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 percentages are going to come down. But my point was, um, and I shouldn't have to put on the cane shades here to, 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 to prove it is that we're moving in the right direction, everybody. And you could, you could accuse me of, um, of being pie in the sky and the eternal optimist or, you know, uh, waving my orange and green pop palms. I want to say, go ahead, have at it. Okay. But we're moving in the right direction. We are coming in the right direction. And Miami in 2024, if they do fulfill their potential and they do get to that 10, 11 win mark, 
it's going to happen because they are now moving in a better I, I uh, love direction how you say, here. I love how you say we are going in the right direction. Like it's already happened. It needs to happen. It should it's happen. It has, yeah. it has not happened You're yet. Right. You're it has not happened yet. This is what I'm trying to tell you. You, you. you are constantly pie in the sky, cart before the horse. Everything's amazing. Like, let's live in the real world for a minute. Nothing has happened yet. It needs to happen. It should happen. But to say it is happening, will happen, we don't know. Well, like, like just tell the truth. Why do, you know, all these, all these podcasters, everyone's the most amazing. Everything at Miami, whoever Miami gets is the most amazing, you know? When they leave, oh, we don't need them anyway. Like, it makes me crazy. Like, just speak the truth. The truth is we're not there yet. We could be there. We might be there. It's looking good. But, like, it has to happen before I'm going to say we're there. And it makes me crazy when I look bad and, like, a negative person because everyone else is like, we're already there. We already made it. Everything's amazing. Like, it's trending the right direction. It hasn't happened yet. Like, that's the truth. Matt, do you know how miserable that – I'll just speak for myself. Do you know how miserable I've been all week? Looking at the 2020, 2021, and 22, 22 recruiting classes, I mean, it's it's it was disgusting. I mean, I would call it puke, but it's worse than puke. I mean, it it was the most horrible, disgusting thing that you could ever imagine that a coach was getting paid four million dollars a year to oversee that absolute horror show body of work. That, by the way, like. I'm not looking to do this by any stretch of imagination, but I was calling it athletic director malpractice. I mean, it, it was so obvious what was going on here and how bad it was. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm not Times guy. I was being honest for those for several years there um, in talking about how bad it was. And they, they finally made the, made, made the changes that they needed to make. Um, but man, that was like the pure misery the last three days. Uh, taking a look back at that. And now I am just, I'm ready to have a festival of happiness, man. Like I, I am ready to throw a parade. I am ready to have a party because this 2023 cycle is starting to look a lot better. And I'm expecting 2024 to be even better than 2023. And I know this program's moving in the right direction. And yeah, you're right. They haven't won the 10 games, 11 games yet this year. No argument. I can't dispute that. But, man, I know I feel a lot better here in the middle of June going into this 2024 season than I've been feeling about a Miami football team for a long time. I mean, I'm almost ready to say 20 years, but they all kind I of – I didn't realize I could still feel things. I thought, I thought you are so old. You, your body, like all the cells are dead. How do you even feel anything? Oh, man. No, I feel it, baby. I feel yeah, it. Yeah, right. Let me tell you something. I've started looking at, I've started looking at some of Miami's opponents – and, like, I thought I was going to find just cakewalk after cakewalk after cakewalk. I'm not a kid. This isn't a joke. Like, they're, some of these teams are not that bad. Like, no, they're, they're not. not. They, they actually have, like, I honestly think that Virginia Tech is going to be tougher than people think. Cal yeah. is going to be tougher than people think. USF might have some stuff on offense going to cause maybe some problems. Even Georgia Tech's not that bad. Like, there's literally probably only four gimmies. Wake Forest, Duke, Ball State, and FAMU, and that's it. And, uh... You know, so that's why I'm not, you know, I'm not the Debbie Downer. I'm the realist. But, like, I'm, I'm starting to research these other teams. They ha There's some talent. Now, now Miami out-talents, I think, all of them, except for Florida State and, and probably Louisville. Uh, but, you know, we've seen them out-talent teams the last 20 years and lose. So, like, again, I'm not ready to say, we're there. We're there. You know, I'm still the sky is falling guy. You know, this guy has, well, this guy has fallen, and we're trying to lift it back up. This guy is still on the ground, Okay. It's not off the ground yet. And for yeah. people to say, like, how amazing everything is, I don't get it. I, I, I don't understand it. It's like you go to the movies and, you know, every movie has a happy ending. I always tell my wife, I said, I'm so sick of these happy endings. I want a bad ending because that's all I've been seeing for 20 years. I'm used to it. I'm like, what are these happy endings in the movies? I don't see those in real life. I don't need that on the movie screen. I'm just depressed when I see it in real life. Like, I want movies to have bad endings. And the Miami Hurricanes to have a good ending. How nice would that be? It's not a joke. Wow. I, tell my wife, I tell my wife that all the time. My wife will literally tell you, you ask my wife what ending I want for a movie, she will always say an unhappy ending. Like, and people know, people are going to make fun of me. I'm like, oh, he's so miserable. He's such a loser. He has no friends. That's damn right I have no friends. What do I need friends for? I mean, I just live in this little hut here, and Gary makes me do video analysis 
and go on this stupid show. I got no time for friends. This is my life. You all should be happy out there. Look at me. Look at me. Compared to me, you should all be very happy. Congratulations. I made you happier today because of how miserable I, I am. Set the bar down here. I am the I'm Miami Hurricanes. Happy. I'm the Miami Hurricanes 2020-21 recruiting class in personified sitting here right now. This this is it. This is what the recruiting class looks like from 2020 and 2021 if you made it into a human being. Miserable. <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm not miserable. I feel things are moving in the right direction. But I will say this. You are correct. Nothing has happened yet. They have to go out and they have to get it done on the football field. Uh, the players got to got to fulfill their potential. They have to perform. The coaches have to step it up and um, do a great job this year. And if everything comes together, I do think that everybody's going to be happy because I think the results will be pretty good. But like Matt said, it's easy to be a paper champion here in the spring and summer. Okay. But when you start taking deep dives into some of these teams, as which is what we're doing, and you're going to see it coming up, like there's some of these teams that are dangerous and, and, and it's not going to be a walk in the park. And even when you had have great teams, you're going to have four five, six games a year that are going to be hanging in the balance in the fourth quarter. And this year will probably be similar to that, no matter how easy we think that this schedule and everything is. And it's not a, it's not a brutal schedule, but there's going to be games where things don't go perfect, where you commit too many penalties. You might turn the ball over. Um, maybe somebody comes up with something schematic, like say like North Carolina did last year with their up-tempo offense that, you know, basically caught Miami's defense uh, big time. Uh, they weren't ready for it. Uh, there's going to be things that are going to happen over the course of the season that are going to make winning a lot more difficult than we think that it's going to be. But as we uh, address the 2023 recruiting class today, and you can see the story on the website, um, there is a lot to be excited about now in terms of just a higher degree, at least an apparent higher degree of talent acquisition that was taking place in the first full cycle, no matter what anybody wants to say, the first full cycle, a 12 month recruiting cycle where the, they were able to recruit the players that they evaluated to be good enough to come into the program uh, under Mario Cristobal. Uh, so hope you guys enjoy that. Um, that look at this 2023 recruiting class. We are not going to break down 2024 yet. Obviously they're just getting onto the team. Um, and that'll be, you know, something that we address in the future, but the sign, the early signs are looking very, very good for 2024 as well. And uh, again, that's why we see a football program that appears to be on the ascent. So that's going to do it for today. We thank you guys so much for joining us. Hope you have enjoyed uh, our state of the use series. To this point, uh, we still have a whole bunch ahead for you guys here in the coming in the coming days, and um, we'll be back uh, to discuss that with you uh, as they come up. So, for Matt Shodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you next time.